For the first video in the Veal's Mail Order A to Z series, we've enlisted the help of fishery scientist Dr. Mike Ladle. A lifelong angler and authority on the biology of sea fish, Mike is a regular contributor to the Sea Angler magazine and has written a number of books on sea fishing. Mike is also regularly called upon by the BBC to appear in radio and TV programmes on fishing and fish behaviour. Well, I guess anybody who uh, knows that I live in Dorset will wonder why I'm down, down here in Avon uh, trying to tell people about fishing uh, the Bristol Channel. And, uh, uh, the answer is that I'm not going to tell uh, people about how to fish the Bristol Channel. I've got somebody who really knows his stuff, Nigel Ainscoe, with me, and he's going to uh, uh, give me the lowdown on it. Um, here we are at the moment, sitting on a salt marsh just above the mud flats between the two seven bridges. And uh, uh, the idea is that uh, when the tides come in a bit, Nigel's going to show us how to fish. But uh, first of all, perhaps you can give me some idea what this uh, fishing's like here. I've no idea at all, so you can start from scratch. I mean, to me, it looks as though we've got an expanse of mud uh, in front of us. How do I know where to fish? Uh, well, I think you've hit the problem on the head. If you actually look along the expanse of beach here, Mike, you will see that there aren't any really positive features. Yes, that's for sure, yeah. So, I mean, basically, if I was going to come and fish here, what I would first want to do is kind of have a look at it before the tide comes in to make sure that I haven't got any really bad snags out in front of me where I'm going to lose a lot yeah. of terminal tackle. Yeah, of course, there, there are a few snags, aren't there? I mean, there's these tussocks of, uh, of grass that have washed in off the edge and they're pretty heavy clay attached to them. So if you get hung in one of them, it's going yes. to gonna lose some gear, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can always go and get it afterwards. The mud <laughs> up to about 60 yards out isn't too bad, but I wouldn't want to go any further. No. No. Not at all. So, you know, you can fish anywhere or are some places better than others? Well, they run quite a few matches down here through the winter and summer. And for some reason, where we're actually sat now, it seems to throw up more fish than if we yeah. look up the beach yeah. a little bit. But why? No one knows. They tell me it's a little bit deeper here. But I'm not so yeah. sure when I actually know. But I guess it's like people fishing anywhere, you know because people catch fish in a spot, other people go there. So, you know, maybe you could fish anywhere. So it's worth trying almost anywhere along this stretch of beach, is it? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Nearly anywhere between the two bridges. Yeah. No problem at all. And the second thing, really, as far as I'm concerned, the, the, the thing that strikes me about this place is mud. There's mud everywhere. Isn't there? So I guess you've got to dress appropriately if you're going to come down. It's not much good coming down in your Sunday best and your suede shoes, is it, to fish on this stretch here? Well, it isn't. You do need to dress pro um, appropriately. Quite obviously, um, if you had a spell of fine weather, coinciding with neat tides. Because, I mean, if you look out on this expanse of water, the tide's a long way off now. And we have big tides. Yeah. But you could come down because it would all be dry. But come down a week later and the water's all been yeah. over the top of the bank here. And yeah. It is a, it's an absolute uh, yeah. mud bath. Yeah. And what about, uh, I suppose the interesting thing for people is what sort of fish can they expect to catch when they come in? Perhaps if, if you could tell me that, I mean, I know I know <laughs> vaguely what it is. I think that's a, why you're here, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. It's supposed to be a good place for, for coddling, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, I don't really see why, to tell the truth, looking at it. It doesn't look like what I used to call cod ground when I lived in the northeast. That was all rocks and kelp, you know. This is just basically mud here. But they do catch a lot of cod here, I gather, don't they? We, we probably have the best run of codling in the country yeah. and has been consistently so. The reason why we've come up to Ast in the first place is that the fish seem to come here early in the season. Yeah. From October up through to November, right. December time, the fish are here. And then they seem to drop back down through the channel. So again. now in early December, this is as good a time as any, is it, Abs right? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. Well, let's, let's hope it is. And what sort of gear do you need to use? I mean, perhaps you have a look at it later on, but, but do you need to cast a long way to fish here? No, not at all. I mean, for the flounders, you can nearly catch them off the end of your rod tip. Yeah. With the codling, they can come anywhere in the tide. Yeah. Um, at short range, at long range. 
it appears that uh, I don't mean to talk about match fishing, but if you look at the results, the lad that's been the most successful, who has been a chap that has managed to cast it as far as he can. Um, so if we we're talking around somewhere around the hundred yard mark, but the beauty of this venue is fish come at all ranges, yeah. and that's why we should. This is well, why we're just here. as well for me, really. <laughs> I don't think I could cast that far. And and what about the the baits? I mean, you're catching cod and flounders. I suppose you get eels here as well in the estuary, don't you? They'd be. Oh yes. Yeah. So, are there you know some baits better than others then? Well, I swear by lug run. Yeah. Um, this. This particular season, or while we're making the video, lugworm tipped off with flat lug. Yeah. That seems to be the killer yeah. bait at the moment. Yeah. Um, but uh, it, you're not going to get lugworms here, I guess, are you? I mean, you've no chance of digging any on this stuff. It doesn't look doesn't look like I can't see a cast anywhere really from where we're sitting. So no. you've got to bring them with you if you come. Have you? Yeah, you do. I mean, you can either buy them from the local tackle shops or go them dig them around the western Sydney area yeah. on the beaches down yeah. there. Yeah, and if people are coming from further away, then they better bring the bait with them when they're coming. What about, is that, have they got any alternative? If they can't get lugworm, I mean, is it worth using other baits? Yes, they can certainly use ragworm. I mean, the black lug that I mentioned can be bought frozen in yeah. most tackle shops, and you only need about two inches of that. So yeah. even if you're using ragworm, which is easier to obtain from the shops than lugworm, yeah. Then, then come here. I mean, at one time it used to be ragworm yeah. and just fish for the flounders. Yeah. But things seem to change. I mean, what about sort of what I'd call cod baits, other cod baits, things like peeler crab or squid or, or mussel? I mean, are they any good? It's funny you should say that. I mean, I bought peeler crab, and the peeler crab has its day. Yeah. But I wouldn't feel uh, that I was going to miss out on a day's fishing if I didn't right. take peeler crab, definitely. That will reassure a lot of people, I guess, you know, because they're pretty expensive nowadays, these things, aren't they? Well, they are. I mean, to me, lugworm is the bait. The bait, right. Okay. Have we got some today? Yes. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> and I suppose the other thing that strikes me about the place is it's very convenient for anybody. You know, you're not, you're not more than about five minutes from the road anywhere along here, are you? So you can come down the M4, the M5, and you can be fishing within five or ten minutes, can't that, you? That's right. Yeah. Well, it's, it's quite different to where I fish in Dorset is. I guess the maximum tide we've got is about two metres, uh, Nigel. So what, what's it like out here then? <laughs> a bit more than that, I guess. <laughs> yeah, much more than that. We have a range of tide at Avermouth that goes from about 8.7 all the way up to 14.6 metres. 14 metres? I mean, it is, well, it's known as, as the second highest rise and fall of tide in the world. Yeah, I know the big tides here. Yeah. Um, they get some, I think they get some bigger ones on the east coast of North America, but, but that's one of the few places that they do get bigger tides. Yeah. So that's it's right. pretty dangerous, as you suggested earlier, to go out on this on this mud from the point of view of the tide. But what about the fishing? I mean, do you, do you have to use grip leads to, to hold the bottom down here then? Yes, I mean, grip leads are absolutely imperative. Yeah. I mean, not only for you to catch fish, but to stop you making yourself a nuisance with other anglers. Yeah. Because if you don't have a grip of lead, the lead will just roll yeah. around in the tide. So it's no good putting a sort of two ounce bomb on and hoping that it's going to hold bottom when the tide starts moving here. Well it is if you jump on it at the very beginning. <laughs> <laughs> so you can bury it in the mud, yeah. right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Is that, an, I mean, just as a matter of interest, is that another problem? I mean, does it, when you cast, will it bury itself in the mud and you have problems getting it back out again? Or? The only time that I've ever had problems with that is when, yeah. the, when I've cast when the water's still just making yeah. and I haven't got very much depth of yeah. water. Yeah. So what I have done is um, in, um, totally to what I'm not prescribing is to pull the lead back again right. so it doesn't get buried in. Right. But otherwise after that there isn't a problem no, at all. No, not a problem. Yeah. Okay. And so from that point of view you're using a grip lead, you've got quite a strong run of tide. Yeah. I guess there's certain ways to to fish it best. I mean, presume you don't just pitch it out there, stick it in the rest and, and, and wait. I mean, do you, are there any sort of tricks of the trade for fishing it? To hold in a, in a hard and heavy tide, one really needs to cast up the tide. So for example, if we've got the tide running here from left to right, yeah. then you really do need to have to cast it up to the left at yeah. 
a 45 degree angle nearly. Yeah. And then to allow the lead to set in, you need to let a lot of line off your right. reel. So right. you're creating so you a, a nice bow, bow in the line. A nice yeah. bow like yeah. that, which gives a chance for the grip right. Right. to go in. And, and when you're fishing, I mean, are you fishing when the tide's running at its maximum? What's, what state of tide's best for fishing? Can you fish any, any state of tide or top or the bottom or what? You can fish at any state of the tide, but to maximise your fish catching potential, then you should fish over the bottom of the tide. Yeah. That's to either, either side or over the top of the tide. Right. I mean, for example, we're at Arst here, so I'd fish an hour and a half each side of high water. Right. That's so that this between the bridges, that's the optimum time as far as you're concerned. Is it the sort of top of the tide? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And is that? I mean, presumably at, at high water. It's slack, is it? I mean, do you get a spell when you don't need a grip lead? When you, I mean, could you fish for what half a minute with a, with a sort of <laughs> I know. I, non grip lead? Or obviously, not? it depends on what tide that, you, yeah. that you're fishing. I mean, the, ma the maximum tide that I'd want to come and fish up here is at 12.4, 12.5. Right. By today, it's about 11.5, and the water will come to 12. So, you need back. a tide table if you're going to come and fish Absolutely. here. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And you certainly need to know whether it's a big spring or not, don't you? Because that's that, from what you're saying, that creates a problem. Well, if you fish a really big spring, say here, then what's going to happen is you're going to be back up onto the oh. grass for a hundred yards. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so you, need a, you need a good cast just to reach the, the water, basically. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You might be wondering at this point how cod managed to find any food in this murky water. Well, of course, if the water's clear, they have large and effective eyes. But in the gloom, they're able to feel and taste along the bottom with their chin barbel and pelvic fin rays. When they encounter edible material, they back up and swallow it. They may even cooperate to dig out buried food. Show us the sort of uh, I'll show the you. leads and gear you use, could you? Well, I've got a tracer yeah. that I'll be using today. Yeah. yeah. And right. First of all, I will say that this is what we call a breakaway grip. Yeah. Okay. This is homemade. Yeah. What happens is that these beads here anchor it into the grooves. Yeah. When a fish actually hits it, or when you're going to retrieve. Yeah, breaks they away, break yeah. 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 Hence yeah. the name, yeah. break away. And what sort of pull does it need to do that then? Does it, I mean, you know, you say when a fish hits it, so that's not too much of a sort of yank to break them away, is it? You can feel yourself, right? You'd be surprised, I think, at the pressure on that. I mean, people might think I'm stupid, I think we've been fishing 40 odd years, you know, what else? I do know that grip leads exist. I've never in my life had to use one in the places I fish, so. Yeah, so it's not know, a lot. There's not a lot of, but it's that's plenty to, to hold it steady in the tide, is it? Absolutely. Yeah. As long as you let a nice bow line out to get the lead pointing up tight, as it were. Yeah, yeah. And what about the what about the trace? You might as well look at that one. See that? I mean, that into, oh, how do you make the bloody thing go back in there? there we go. Right, the trace. I should should really put fresh hook lens on that. Right. But yeah. This is one that. Yeah, I've but it gives me an idea. Yeah. yeah. This is size one hooks. Yeah. I, I'd only use size one up here at Arst. Yeah. I mean, this is a three hook rig. I'm not saying yeah. that everyone needs to no, no, use no. a three hook. So rig. you could use one if you want to. Use so one yeah. if you want to. I use a three hook yeah. rig though. Size one hooks, a strong hook. Yeah. Any of the manufacturers will make a heavier duty right. um, size one hook. And the reason is that we've got flounders out there as right. well. If we use too big a hook, then we miss out on right. Now, to me, they look too small for, for codling. I mean, you know, if I was going cod fishing, I, would, I wouldn't have thought of using a, a size one, I don't think. Now, for flounders, yeah, perhaps I would, although I guess a big flounder would have no bother. How big are the flounders that you get here, then? They seem to run between 10 ounces to a yeah. pound, but yeah. Obviously, better ones do turn right. up, but we don't have big flounders. I'll give you an example. The, the Bristol Channel Federation have specimen sizes, right. and a flounder of 110, 112 right. will 
So not, not, not mo I mean, that's a nice fish, but yeah. not a monster sort of thing. Yeah. So these hooks are probably, but do you miss coddling on these then? Don't seem to. Don't seem to, no. Don't seem to. The coddling at the moment are up to about three pounds. Obviously, I say that, and someone will yeah. say, I've had a ten pounder, yeah. but they've generally been at smaller. Now, fish. you're not going to get a, a huge bait on there. I mean, you're not going to fill that with ten lug worms or something, are you? That, that no. Hook. So what, what do you do? We, just one one worm on it basically, is it, at a time? One or two worms. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think I can manage that. Okay. Whether I can reach any fish, that's another matter. Right? Well, you got chest weight, you don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to pretend that this is my uh, tackle, but uh, in fact, it's been loaned to me for the day very kindly by Dave Box of Veal's Mail Order. Um, Nigel's brought his own gear along, but. Uh, uh, if you just uh, perhaps give us an idea, Nigel, about what the uh, what we've got and what it's supposed to do, because uh, you're the man who knows about it. I haven't got a clue, really. <laughs> all right, thanks, Mike. OK, first of all, we have a rod here that needs to be capable of chucking five to six ounces of lead plus bait. Well, so why do we need five or six ounces? Couldn't we, could we use less? Or? You could use less, yeah. yes, certainly. I mean... On the smaller tides, there's no reason why a man couldn't come down right. here with his carp rod yeah. and three ounces of lead yeah. and fish. But but generally, five ounces is about the right sort of... Five ounces is yeah. about right, especially if you're throwing the lead between 60 and 90 yards. Yeah. You need to have that weight, plus the grips on there to hold, to hold in the tide. Right, okay. Secondly, the reel that we're using is a high retrieve reel. It's loaded with 17 pound line, plus a shot leader. The high retrieve reel will help in all parts of the channel because there's quite a bit of debris, rocks and boulders and that enables you to be able yeah. to crank in your lead and bait much more quickly than the small little six fives yeah. and stuff like that. I mean I'm not used to any of this sort of stuff but that's, uh, so that's obviously a pretty uh, high quality reel that one isn't it? I mean it's an Abu 7000. 7500. 7, yeah, yeah. Very, yeah, very nice tool. Yeah. And the rod? The rod, the rod is, is a, what I'd call a middle of the range rod. It's made by Penn, and it will, it's it's rated at throwing four to eight ounces. But one normally finds that these rods work out at best around five yeah. and a quarter ounces. Yeah. Nice tip on there for showing bite and to set in the tide. And if we're lucky enough today we get a codling. We'll see that tip spring back out. I thought I was guaranteed that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who's been paying you, Mike. <laughs> well, I suppose the important thing is to have a look at the at the business end of it. Is it? I mean, uh, again, it, it looks a fairly straightforward rig, but is there other sort of variations of rigs that we ought to use? Well, what we're going to use today is the. I'm a great fan of using three hooks whenever possible. Yeah. Obviously over rough ground I can't well, use Why, use why the three hooks really? What's the... Well I think it probably comes from my days of being competitive on the match scene. It gives me three options really. Yeah. I mean it certainly allows you to present three different types of bait. I mean for example I could have lugworm on the top hook, yeah. ragworm on the middle hook, lugworm and crab or rag and crab or yeah piece of fish, but, anything. But it, would you normally you'd just fish three lug, would you? I mean, if lug's a good bait here, you would fish three lug. Well, I would, Yeah. but uh, but quite obviously, fish like us don't always behave um, as you expect them to. No. So no. this gives me a chance to find out what the fish are feeding. Right. It gives me three chances to, to someone who's using a single yeah. hook to experiment with baits. Yeah, so what sort of what sort of breaking strains the bits and pieces on that then? This, this is fairly hefty stuff, this uh, uh, this yellow stuff, isn't it? This is 80 pound Sigon that I'm using. Right. But I'm, you know, you can use any line between 60 and 80 pound. Yeah. It's important that you use a very heavy strain yeah. of lime. Yeah. It's just for safety's sake. Really. And this, this brightly coloured stuff doesn't make any difference. I guess they can't see it anyway in the, in the mucky water out here, can they? I, so, I don't think it does, no, but everyone no. has their own. Yeah. And what about the what about the traces then there? The traces. Th this could be any mono. Yeah. I mean, this is a trout leader. Yeah. The is that about twenty pound breaking strain? That is it. This is thirty that I've got yeah, on yeah. there. The 
reason that you can see, I've got little sequins on here. Yeah. I've got little rubber stops behind. Yeah. Now, when you have a rig that's clipped down and it's going to travel yeah. through the air like that, the bait's going to get forced up the snood. Yeah. So by adjusting oh, right. that being adjustable, up, like, yeah. that's your bait stops and it stops the worm yeah. from riding yeah. over the top. Yeah. 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 And I guess if you're putting a bit of welly into the cast, then that's a big advantage, isn't it? Stop the bit. Do you always use that rig then, Nigel? I mean, what happens, what happens if it doesn't work? <laughs> that can happen quite often. Yeah. If I feel that um, by using this rig that I've covered the medium to, say, getting towards long yeah. distance and I'm not fishing, picking fish up, then what I'll swap over to is what I call a real distant rig, yeah, yeah. which is this one here. Which are... Oh, right. That's what I've got on my gear then. Well, you're, they tell me you <laughs> cast a long way, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Who the hell told you that? <laughs> Some liar. Pigeon carrier. Yeah, <laughs> right. This, this rig works on the principle of an impact shield. We've, we've got two hooks on here. And it works like this. You, you put your lug worm right. over here, yeah. two or three. And then what we do is when the bait is on, we then wrap that round like that so that is then held fixed yeah. in position. Yeah. That stops the bait from riding up the hook, and then it goes down and clips onto this impact shield. Just above the shield, we have a crimp and we have a bead. Yeah. And I, I've already adjusted it, but just yeah. to show you, that crimp moves. All right. We put that onto there. Yeah. yeah. Just the crimp down. So you get a perfect sort so of. So it's a perfect fit. Yeah. Then clip it back on. Oh, mind you. That way, your bait is then released. Yeah. Out of the clip. Every time, hopefully. Every time. It's a fail safe yeah. device. Anybody who knows me will realise this isn't my tackle. Nigel comes fishing with all his traces ready made and neatly organised in smart wallets. Our gear was set up well in advance, so it was just a question of waiting for the water to arrive. Impatient as ever, I couldn't wait and plodged out across the sloppy mud to meet the incoming tide. I won't say beat that, Nigel, because I've a horrible feeling you can. Well, from here. It was impossible not to be impressed by Nigel's casting ability, let alone the neat efficiency of his gear. Having said that, and despite my limitations, it was not long before I had my first bite. The problem then was how to break the lead free without falling over in the mud. Just wind down onto it, Mike, unless yeah. you've hurt one of those tussocks. Okay. So you can't, that's why you can't strike because yeah. you've got too much line stretch. There's no doubt about that, it's a fairly thin whiting. I wonder where it had parasites, but it doesn't appear to have. Got a nice mouthful of teeth. Do you know that most of what these things eat is other whiting? 40% of the diet of big whiting is little whiting. But we were after coddling, and Nigel soon obliged. Even at 75 to 100 yards range, a modest whiting or codling will give a good rattle on the rod tip. 
I thought that a fish that small would have rattled the tip so hard, would you? Nigel was regularly picking up fish with his longer casting, so I swallowed my pride and let him chuck one out for me. And this brought immediate success. I would have thought so. Yeah. About, nice. Right? It's an eel, isn't it? No, it's a green eel. Yeah, better one though. Better for what? <laughs> <laughs> you cast it out. <laughs> you, can, you can take it off. Take it off. <laughs> from the vibration, yeah. but I like to think it was a nice juicy crab I put on there. Right. It might have been that, might it? <laughs> <laughs> the next early season venue is a few miles down the channel and is called Seven Beach. The fishing is from the seawall, one and a half hours either side of high water. The tide size needs to be between 11.5 and 12.5 metres, although locals will fish bigger or smaller tides. If you do not want to fish off the sea wall, the Avermouth side or the left hand side of the wall facing out to sea offers fishing off a shingle bar or mud and scurvy grass. The species to be caught are, in winter, flounders, cod, whiting and the occasional conger. In spring and summer, silver eels, flounders, bass, mainly school, although up to 10 pounds, and the occasional conger. Tackle and baits to use the same as we've just used at Alst. Ten miles down Channel of Ost is the town of Portis Head. Leave the M5 at junction 19 and follow the signs for the seafront. Park up by the boating lake and it's only a short walk to Battery Point. Battery Point is perhaps the most famous mark on the Bristol Channel coast. Each year a few lucky anglers catch cod to £25 from this spot. Battery Point is very deep water and the tide runs very hard and strong here. Fishing can be had at all stages of the tide and the species caught can be thornbacks, codling, whiting, conger, sole, dogfish and any other species is quite likely to turn up here. If standing on Battery Point and facing out to sea, to the right is an area known as the sandbanks. Care must be taken not to be cut off when fishing these banks. The banks expose on 12 meter or above tides and fishing is into a deep gully. Rotten bottom rigs are advised. In winter, the species that are caught are codling and whiting with the occasional sole. On smaller tides, between the sandbanks and battery point is a series of ledges and on tides of 10.5 meters and below. This can be fished when the weather is calm. Across the bay is an area known as the Yacht School. This produces the same species that are caught off Battery Point to similar methods. The fishing here is a low water venue. A short drive from Porter's Head is another popular venue, the seaside town of Clevedon. 
The Victorian Pier is easily found by following the signs as you leave the M5 at Junction 20. The pier itself was built in 1869 and provided the focus of fishing in Clevedon until 1970, when its partial collapse and subsequent closure on safety grounds saw the sad end to angling for generations of local anglers. After a 20-year campaign to raise funds, the pier is now open again, offering comfortable and sometimes very productive sport. The pier once held the British soul record, and to enable you to fish the pier, day tickets are available from the kiosk at the entrance to the pier. The way to fish the pier is to use a simple running ledger or pattern oyster. Long casting is not necessary, which is just as well because the tide runs very hard here. Sometimes one will need to use up to half a pound of lead to hold in the tide. And if, if you are facing the tide, then uptiding will work with five or six ounces of breakaway lead. Within sight of the pier is Lady Bay, another popular mark. Follow the coast road in the Portishead direction and turn left by the Portishead sign into Bay Road and park up as far down Bay Road as you can. Then take the coastal footpath in the Portishead direction until the ledges become obvious where you can fish from. Lady Bay, or also known as St Mary's, can be fished at all stages of the tide, although one hour up and three hours down is favourite, or three hours down to low water and one hour up. Rigs to be used are clipped down pattern oyster at range. The bottom is mixed and the species caught are cod, codling, whiting, dogfish, conger, flounder, dabs, silver eels and sole. This is an extremely popular mark and at times anglers stand shoulder to shoulder. If you can't find a place to fish immediately, follow the coastal path in the Portis Head direction for maybe up to a mile or more, but there are ledges all the way along and a fishing spot will become available. Below Clevedon is the venue known as Sand Point. This mark is best reached by leaving the motorway at Junction 21 the Western Supermare exit, and follow the signs for Kew Stoke and Sand Point. The road narrows to a lane, but the signs are numerous, so you shouldn't get lost. You got one? More big crop. I'm gonna have to go down here, Mike. Huh? Yeah. The trouble is it's coming over this bloody rock down there and I my line is in the way here, you know?
nice little fish of about three and a half pounds. Taken lunk and squid bait there on the bottom hook. Very nice. Okay. Yeah, excellent. Yep. I have just had a bite of my right hand rod, what we call a breakout. I've got line all over the rocks at the moment, so I've got to wind down quite quickly to catch up. Yes. Another run-of-the-mill fish of around two and a half to three pounds. Well, a bit different this then, uh, Nigel, where we were yesterday, isn't it? That's how far down the, the coast are we from the place we went yesterday? I think it's the crow flies, about ten miles, Mike. Right. And uh, instead of all that horrible squelchy mud, at least we've got some firm rock to stand on. If we, what do they call this place again? This is Sandpoint. Sandpoint, yeah. And it's obviously pretty popular, judging from the number of uh, people that are fishing down here, isn't it? Yeah, it's very popular this time of the year. Very good fishing. Wow. Yeah, and what, what sort of fish are you expecting to catch here? Same sort of things as cod, cod, fish? cod, cod yeah. small cod. But having said that, it will throw up big thorn back. It will throw up bass. And yeah. as we saw earlier, there was an angler up there still had a late season conger, conger as well. Conger, yeah, yeah. So a good variety of fish here yeah, again. Plus the white. Well, I mean, already we've had three small codling and a few white, you know, we saw yeah. uh, uh, the same same sort of spectrum of fish as we had at the other place, plus a few big ones of other sorts, probably. I mean, I guess we wouldn't get so many thornbacks or uh, conger up at the other spot we're at, would we? It's very rare. Um, I don't understand why we don't get thornback up there because some of the yeah. ground up there is very suitable. Yeah. But. Um, whether people don't fish for them or they just don't go up there, I really wouldn't like to right. say. Certainly down here, there's a lot yeah. of thornbacks caught. Now, I, I suppose this place, the, again, the, one of the difficulties is obviously getting here. We have to say a bit more about that to people, I suppose, about how they're going to get here if you want to come and fish. And when you've got it, it looks incredibly snaggy, doesn't it? I mean, the stuff you're on, if you're fishing on this stuff, you're going to be losing tackle every cast, but it's not as bad as that. When you cast out, oh, it? it's not. No, it's a. I mean, to answer the ground, I mean, we fish at low water. Yeah. We fish about yeah. two hours either side of low water. The particular mark we're stood out of on now is the knuckles. But anywhere along um, the area they call um, Sand Point, from the very point itself, going down that way, right. which is Middle Hope Bay, which is beyond where all you can see these anglers on the horizon, yeah, yeah. all the way through there um, you can fish and it will produce the same type of fishing. So you've, you've got, got miles of fishing basically along here? We have, yeah, we yeah. have indeed. The first thing I'd like to, to say is that I am not using a three hook rig today, I am using the adjustable panel rig or the, or the rig as we called the distance rig yesterday. The other thing that you must remember on working on ground like this is that it blunts your hooks very quickly. And if you just have a, a small little diamond file and just touch the edge of the the hook up, you can always tell if it's sharp on the back of your thumb now by just putting it in like that. If it catches, it's got a really nice sharp point on it. I'll show you how to bait up what I call a a lug and squid parcel and what we do is put the lugworm onto the hook first of all like this 
Lots of people seem to think that you need to have huge baits for cod. Well, that might be so, but we seem to have a lot of success with our cod fishing with using two or three lugworm on the hook. The other reason for using the lug parcel is we've been troubled by crab today. And crab just love lug and they just love squid. But by cover it, protecting your lugworm, as I'm going to show you in a minute, with, with the squid, it does allow your bait to be out there just that little bit longer. Once again, two lugworm onto the hook. That is then wrapped round the top hook, which is just, the line is just placed through the eye and slides freely on there. Then what I do is, I prefer to get a piece of squid, put it on through the bottom hook like that, and allow it to come back over the top. And then I hold it in position, covering all the lugworm up, all the way up to the, to the next hook. I then get some knitting elastic and start to bind it round. The reason we use knitting elastic is because you don't have to tie it off. It's so fine, it just binds nice and neatly into whatever you're doing, whether it be crab, squid as I'm doing now. Make sure that you don't mask your hook point. If it starts to go round, pull it round, making, ensuring the hook point is free. There we have a, lig, a lug and squid parcel, and most of the lug weren't protected by the squid. It's also nice and streamlined, so it also casts well. This in particular has proved over the years to be a very successful bait for thornback, but the cod love it as well. Also, when fishing on marks like this, where we're fishing for short periods, three and a half to four hours, we double pat, and I have another rig laid up on this rest so if I had a fish and I reeled a fish in or even if I was going to change the bait and just reel it straight in, unclip it because on the end of, of my shot leader there's a number six mustard split link so I can just clip that open, put it through the swivel and I'm away and I'm fishing all the time. You must keep your bait in the water at all at all occasions. Otherwise, if you're baiting up for five or ten minutes after every cast, you're losing an awful lot of time. Nigel mentioned earlier that he prefers to use smaller baits. It's a known fact that in very cold water, cod are not capable of opening their mouths as wide as this, and can only eat small food items. Western town beaches can be fished with light gear, especially in summer, ideal for the holiday angler who only wants to bring a feeder rod, short casting for school bass, flounder and silver eels. At the far end of Western Bay, across the River Axe at Uphill, is the massive limestone promontory known as Breen Down. From junction 22 of the M5, take the B3140 to Burnham on Sea. Bait and tackle can be bought even on Sundays from Thyers at nearby Highbridge. If you head for Barrow and carry on past the caravan sites of Breen, park at the end of the road. 200 zigzag steps then lead you up to the top of the dam. It's got to be said that this isn't a climb for the faint-hearted, but once at the top, the views across the Somerset levels and Barrow Sands below are quite spectacular. Small lug can be dug from the muddy sands all along the beach, but it is probably better to bring your own bait with you. From the top of the steps across the greensward is a single trap road that leads out 
to the abandoned fort at the point. Leaving the road and following the many paths down on the western side will bring you to many high or low water marks which during autumn and winter produce conger, cod and codling. At the end of the down, in front of the fort, is an area known as the Howe Rocks. The tide races through here, and mainly in summer, on spring tides, very large bass have been caught. The method to use is a rotten bottom on a 30 pound line, cast into a gully using either a large squid or large peeler bait. But be warned, you can easily get cut off here as the gullies fill behind you at an alarming rate. I just realised I've left, I've left a box of squid in the fridge. <laughs> Got any really big beats with you, Dave? I haven't got any really big beef. Oh. 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 <laughs> oh, no, just using No, it's alright, I'll just use my brains, I'll just squash the loop up. While Dave and I set up our gear and huddled out to the freezing gale. Nigel was already into his first coffee on a lug and crab cocktail. A bit hairy, but worth it in the end. Very slippery. Do you know, I've only just uh, cast that out. Considering I missed a bite on the other rod. Yeah. Here we are. Oh. three and a half pounds. It's taken on the top of the... I'm still getting my breath back. <laughs> Nigel had said earlier, yeah, when fish start to feed, the often came and took success. As usual, he was not far wrong.
Well, that's a bit better than Nigel, isn't it? Hey there, not, uh, not too bad. That's a nice fish, that uh, second one you had. That's better. That's much more the stamp of fish. That you would I'd like to catch on. Oh, yeah. most definitely. Yeah. I mean, I'm not complaining with the, with the smaller Smaller's, size. No. But this seems to be in the size that we've caught off the shores all the way through this winter. Yeah. Whereas I know when in the uptiding boats or in the conventional boats, They've been catching six to ten pound yeah. class fish. Goodness knows why they haven't come in shore this year, or certainly haven't in any yeah. numbers. I guess these, I mean, they're only two or three years old at the most, these uh, coddle, you know, they grow very quickly, these things. So they're only, uh, they're still only young fish, these. But what they call this place, Breen Down, is it this place we're on today? Yeah, we're on Breen Down. Um, um, we're fishing more or less off the top of the cliffs today, aren't we? I mean, we're a bit higher up than we've been in the past. Which is nice for me. It's not quite as uh, not quite as muddy as the other place we've been. But what's it like? What's the ground like out in front? Of us? What we have out in front of us, is we're in Western Bay. We've got Western Supermare to the right yeah, of there. Yeah, can just see it across the just, bay. There, just like. across the bay there. Yeah. And what we're fishing here is onto sand and mud. If you were to be here at low tide and to walk out, you'd be able to actually walk out onto the sand or sandy, gritty. Mud. Yeah. What we're doing at the moment now is we're not casting a long way. We're using conventional flowing, flowing lead and bait. And what's happening is the tide's picking the lead up. We're not using grip leads either. Today. No. So and just sort of uh, a running lead. A running lead. What, what is it? Are they about four ounces? Well, you've got on, they? well, today, as you can probably see by the, it's really quite rough. We've got five ounces today. Yeah but you can use less. And what happens is the tide always runs right to left here. No matter what state of the tide, it's running right to left. And your lead gets swept round yeah. into where the sand joins through the rocks. And that's where the fish appear to run. And this is where both of these fish have come from today. Now, now today it's difficult casting, really. I mean, we're having to really force it to get it anywhere against this wind. Even you aren't sort of casting a long way today. But, no. but I guess under sort of less windy conditions, there'd be no problem even me getting the bait out of where the fish are today. I mean, it's easy reach for anybody. I mean, an yeah. overhead overhead lob will put the bait where the fish are, won't it? That's right. That's right. 40 yards, no more. I mean, if you cast, if you cast any further, you've just got more line that's going to get swept yeah. round in the current. And you've more chance of then it running across all the rocks and getting it snagged and frayed, etc. Yeah. And the baits are the same ones we use in the other places in the Bristol town we've been. Crab, lugworm, squid, they're all liable to catch fish. They're all liable to catch fish. But crab and lugworm are still the, the favourites, are they? Well, they are for me. Yeah. Having said that, I'd be quite happy to come here and use the squid parcel that I was using yeah. if I couldn't get hold of crab. Um, no, it's very effective. There's some sensational catches taken off here. I haven't seen them. But no, I do but know they do some, catch them, yeah. Some and, really good and what about the state of the tide? I mean, what's the best conditions to fish it? Really? For myself, I, I like to fish two hours of high water, right. either side of high right. water. And a big tide or a little tide? Today we're on a smallish tide, which isn't ideal, because as you've seen, yeah. the leads haven't moved until no. after the top of the tide. But anything up to a 13 metre, a table right. amount of tide, right. the bigger the tide, the better. The bigger the better, yeah. But I mean, even on a tide like this, you're still catching one or two fish, so it's not, uh, no, it's never hopeless, obviously. Yeah. But what you don't have, and I think you, you know, although this is your first time on here, Mike, yeah. is you can see that when we first arrived, you could see the bottom. Right. And we haven't the depth, quite obviously, no. the fish, it seems to fish better when they've got when more depth. Depth, across yeah. yeah. I mean, as, as you know, where you've got rocks, and where you've got sand, you know, there's eddies and stuff created, and that's where the fruit right. gets washed off, and yeah. all kinds of things. Now, I guess just for anybody who's not been here, it's pretty exposed in this place, isn't it? <laughs> We're sitting behind a bush at the minute <laughs> to try and keep out the wind, just so we can actually hear what we're saying. But uh, uh, out there, it's about 4-7 from, feels like it's come from Siberia, and the sea's pretty rough, um, but you can find a reasonable amount of shelter to fish. I mean, you know, 
As long as you're well wrapped up, it's the end of January now, yes. so it's never going to be any colder, I guess. Forgive me, I keep looking down there, I keep looking at the other rod. I see I, that, I've not had a bike before. Well, so did I. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> well, perhaps you have, yeah. So, uh, anyway, if you catch a third one, I think that will be, uh, I'll have to pack in, because I think that's probably uh, enough for me, I can't take any more after that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's fantastic. Well, despite the horrible weather, thanks very much, Nigel, I think it's been fantastic, the trip down to Bristol Channel. You showed me how to catch the fish anyway, that's for sure. Um, hopefully you'll be able to come down into Dorset sometime and show me how to catch them down there as well. I suppose that'd be the, uh, the ideal. Uh, the weather should be a bit better than it's been in, uh, uh, in the Bristol Channel, shouldn't it? <laughs> I shall really look forward to that. I, I mean, I know we're slinging heavy legs around here, but I really like my bike fishing as well. Yeah, yeah. So, I've read your articles, I've seen the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to coming. <laughs> uh, oh well, maybe, maybe. But uh, whether we'll catch as much as we've done here, I don't know. I think this has been damn good fishing. Really. And anybody who wants to uh, catch codling in the winter, like you said, I think on the first morning we were out, you couldn't do better than this, could you? No, you can't. I, I would go as far as to say you get the best problem. Fantastic. Fantastic.